So let's go over the challenge date stamp. Create a function date stamp that accepts a function and returns a function. The return function will accept whatever arguments the pass in function accepts and return an object with a date key whose value is today's date, not including the time, represented as a human readable string. And an output key that contains the result from invoking the pass in function. Okay, so before we start coding, let's pseudocode out our strategy. So we are going to declare a function labeled date stamp that has one parameter, a function. Then our date stamp function is going to return a function that accepts any arguments that the passed in function accepts. And then this function is going to return out an object. And in order to do so, we need to create an object to return. Then the prompt asks us to create a property in this object with the key date and assign it the value of today's date, not including the time. Then the prompt asks us to create another property with the key output and assign it the value of the output of the past in a function and its arguments. And then once we're done building out this object, we can go ahead and return the object. All right, so let's go ahead and build this out. So we're gonna declare a function labeled date stamp and it accepts one parameter, a function. So I'm just gonna use func as a parameter label. And then our date stamp function returns a function. So I'm going to create an anonymous function to return. Now here's the catch. It says that our date stamp func, our date stamp function returns out a function that accepts any arguments that the pass in function accepts. So how do we handle a situation where we are not provided the definite number of expected arguments a function has? Well, there's something called the rest parameters in JavaScript, and let's go check out some MDN documentation as to what the rest parameter does. So looking at the description, it says the rest parameter syntax allows a function to accept an indefinite number of arguments as an array. Okay, so let's take a look at the example block below and see how to use the rest parameter. So first we have a function labeled sum, and here is the rest parameter. The syntax is three dots, and then you provide a label for the parameter. And if we take a look, we have a variable sum initialized to zero. And then notice in the next line, we're calling the native array method for each on the args, the parameter we label. So under the hood, the rest parameter will accept any amount of arguments and it's going to store it in an array. And that array's label is going to be whatever you define the parameter label to be. So hence why we are going to use the for each or iterate through the args, which is currently an array. And it looks like what we'll be doing with each number, uh, we will be adding the current number to the current value of the sum, and then we'll reassign sum. And then once we finish iterating through our array, um, or all of our arguments, we're going to return sum. And just to show you that our arguments are now stored in a um, array, we'll go ahead and throw in a console log here console logging the args. Okay, so if you look at our test case below, it looks like we are invoking sum, and we're passing in three numbers, one, two, and three, and the expected output is six. So knowing that we are going to be passing in three numbers, we should expect to see the args being logged as an array of one, two, and three. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and run our code and see what we get. And there we go. So you can see when we console log the args, we do receive an array of one, two, and three, all the arguments we passed in. And then we return out sum with the expected outcome of six. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more about the rest parameter, let's go ahead and implement that into our code. So we're returning out an anonymous function that accepts any arguments. So we're gonna use the rest parameter here. And let's label our um, argument array as args. So we can handle that later. Cool. Now this anonymous function, we're going to create a object. So I'm gonna declare a constant and label it results and we'll initialize it to an empty object. Then we're going to create a property with the key date and the value of today's date, not including the time. So how do we do that? Well, our prompt gives us a lovely hint here to look up what the date object is. So let's hop on over to MDM and see what the date object is. And I'm going to scroll down to the constructor. So the description says when called as a function, the date object or the date constructor returns a string representation of the current date and time. So if you recall, our prompt is only asking for the current date, not the time, and it's asking for the date in human readable form. So there are tons of native methods um, that the date object has. So we're going to just scroll through and see if there's a built-in method that returns out the value we are looking for, and looks like there is. And it is the to date string method. So if we read the instruction, or rather the description, it says it returns the date portion of the date object as a human readable string, like so, which is exactly what we're looking for. So we're going to implement the to date string method in our code. Let's hop on back. All right, so let's go ahead and build out this date property. So we've got to create a property. So how we do that is call the object and then we'll use a dot notation and provide the key's name, which is date, and initialize it and provide the value of today's date. So we're going to call or create a new instance of our date object. And how we can do that is by using the new keyword and then calling the constructor. And then we're going to chain the to date string method that we found. So that way we can get today's date without the time in a human readable string. Cool. Now we're going to go ahead and create the second property using the dot notation and providing the key name, which is output, and initializing it to the value of the output of the pass in function and its arguments. So let's go ahead and invoke our pass in function or func. And now your first instinct might be to just write in args, right? Because that's what we defined up over here in our anonymous function. However, if you recall, the rest parameter, it accepts any number of arguments and it stores all of those arguments as an array with the label of args. So if we were to invoke our pass in function with args, we would be invoking our function with an array rather than each individual argument. So how do we pass in each argument individually into our pass in function and not as an array? Well, there's something called the spread operator in JavaScript. So let's go check out some documentation on that. All right, so looking at MDN again, let's go read the description for spread syntax. So the spread syntax allows an iterable such as an array expression or a string to be expanded in places where zero or more arguments for function calls or elements for array literals are expected. Okay, so to visualize more so what the spread operator does, let's look at the example code below. So we have a function labeled sum, and it takes in three arguments, three parameters rather, x, y, z. And if we look at the definition, it returns x plus y plus z. And then below we have a constant 
labeled numbers initialized with the value of an array of one, two, and three. So if we look at our test case below, we are invoking our function sum, and then here it is, the spread operator. So it looks identical to the rest parameter, but they're totally different. So what is this is doing, and we're passing in numbers right after. So because numbers is an array, the spread operator, using the spread operator, we're going to expand and pass in the content of the array into the function rather than just passing in the array. So if we look at what we're expecting, we're spreading in the elements of numbers. So it should be one, two, and three, and then we'll return out one plus two plus three. So the expected output should be six. So if we take a look, yes, we do get six. So let's go ahead and implement that into our code. So going back to our invocation of our pass in function, rather than passing in args, which is an array, we want to pass in the content of our args array. So we're going to use the spread operator here. And then once we're done building out our object, we can go ahead and re return our object. So let's go test out our code. So I'm going to uncomment our test case below and take a look. We have a function label stamped multiply by two, initialized to the function definition, or rather the invocation of date stamp, passed in with anonymous function. This anonymous function accepts one argument, n, and it returns out n times two. Cool. And then we have our two test cases. First one is stamped multiply two. We're invoking it with the argument four, and that should log out an object with a key, or rather a property with a key date, with its value of today's date, and then the output as the output of the invoked function. So it should be four, four times two, so eight. And then below we have another test case invoking stamp multiply two, passing in six as an argument. And we should be expecting to see an object back with a property date, with the value of today's date, another property labeled output with the value of 12 because six, six times two is 12. All right, so let's hit run code and let's see what we get. And then there we go, we have our two objects, the first one with the date of today's date and the output of eight. And our second object has a property date, today's date, and then the output of 12. 